Okay, good morning and welcome to our One Georgia webinar. We have Jenna Webb with us, who's the director of One Georgia, and she is going to take over here and start sharing in just a second. And um, just a couple of things. Um, if you have questions as we go through, you uh, feel free to type that into the chat box and we'll read those out at the um, at the breaks or at the end whenever Jenna wants to, to take on questions. If you'd prefer to ask your question, um, by unmuting yourself when um, when she asks for any questions that you may have any clarification that you need, um, feel free to unmute yourself and um, and ask that question. We are also recording and um, it does take a few days up to about a week um, for me to send this on to um, our website people who uh, put this up on YouTube. So as soon as that's available, um, I'll send you the link as a follow up so that you can get all the resources, um, watch it again and um, and find out everything that you need to know. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jenna so that we don't waste any of your um, valuable time this morning. Thank you, Natalie. Can you see my screen? See my screen. Yes. OK, perfect. So what I'm going to do is uh, All right, are we good now? Okay. Go back to my screen here. Okay. You got me now, Natalie? Just shake your head yes. Okay. All right, so as Natalie said, I'm Jenna Webb. Uh, I know most of you all on the call as I served as the Region 10 rep prior to coming over to the One Georgia Authority last September. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of go through. Um, we've had several new programs that have fallen underneath the One Georgia Authority over the past uh, year. So I'm going to go through our traditional funding that I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, but sort of give you some updates on those, as well as talk about a couple of our new programs. And after I discuss each one of the programs, I'll stop and answer any questions about that specific one. If you want to ask there, feel free. Um, and if you don't, if you want to save your questions to the end or you want to put them in the chat, Natalie and Tanya can monitor the chat for me as we go along. So feel free to interrupt me. It will not hurt my feelings. Um, so I want to kind of tell you about the members. Let's see if my screen wants to. There we go. So here's our One Georgia team. Um, as I said, I serve as the executive or the director now. Christopher Nunn, our commissioner at DCA, serves technically as the executive director. And this past year, we have hired Christy Middleton to join us as a One Georgia grants coordinator. Christy really works hand, hand on with our um, grant recipients. So she can really walk you through our new eCivis and GRAM portal when you're trying to accept your awards, upload any award documents. Um, she's really good to help you walk through if you have questions when you're submitting applications. But she's sort of the behind the scenes working directly with the communities on moving our grants forward um, after they've been awarded. She's been a great asset to our team. She just joined us in December and has hit the ground just really running and is just so sweet. So if you ever need any help, she's willing to jump in there and hop on a Teams call with you and show you how to do it. Um, so she's been great. Always feel free to reach out to either one of us if you have any questions. So a little background on what the One Georgia Authority is. So uh, we provide grant and loan programs towards infrastructure improvements to catalyze economic development. The goal of our authority is to offer financial partnerships with rural communities to create strong economies in various business sectors, allowing new and, new and existing industries, both large and small, to flourish. We're trying to bridge Georgia's economic divide by ensuring balanced growth across the state, helping to guarantee that all Georgians have access to economic opportunities in their own communities. So our authority is um, we work underneath the Georgia Department of Community Affairs, but we are a set aside authority uh, um, within the state. The governor uh, is the chairman of our board and uh, the DCA commissioner, Christopher Nunn. He, like I said, he serves as executive director and also a member of the authority board. We also have the director of the Department of Economic Development, Commissioner uh, Pat Wilson. We have the Office of Planning and Budgeting Director. We have the Department of Revenue Commissioner, um, as well as the Lieutenant Governor and the Speaker of the House that serve on our authority. We also, those are our voting members of our One Georgia Authority Board. We also have some members of the State House and Legislate, uh, State House and Senate that serve on our Oversight Committee for us. So they assist with some of our other programs um, on recommendations. Um, and like I said, our Oversight Committee, they're, they're 
there as well as each, at each one of our quarterly board meetings. They just don't have a vote when it comes to recommendations of awards. So we exist to promote the health, welfare and safety and economic security of the state's rural citizens. We were created by tobacco settlement funds in the early 90s and now we're funded through state appropriations. Um, just a reminder that um, one Georgia can only grant funds directly to a city, county, or a registered authority in good standing. If you were in attendance at the recent GEDA spring workshop, Kim Carter, who's uh, a division director for our community and finance division, she talked to us about the fact that a third, if you put Georgia and you divided it into threes, one third of our state that is a registered authority is not in good standing with DCA. So it's just a reminder to make sure you get your authority registration. Um, make sure that's always intact with us. It's a very easy process. Your regional reps can direct you to our research team if you have any questions about your authority registration. But prior to us granting any funds or reviewing applications, you have to be in good standing as your authority with the state of Georgia in order to be able to draw down those funds. So we provide funding through our EDGE, Equity, Rural Innovation, and Broadband Grant programs. And we have another new program this year called our Region, our Border Region Retail Program, which has no funds attached to it. So I'll talk to you a little bit about the end, at the end about our broadband and our, our Border Region Retail programs. Um, but our main, force, main areas of funding that we focus on are EDGE, Equity, and Rural Innovation. So I'm going to go, um, this is just a general map of our one georgia authority um, eligible counties you will see here the dark green are what we consider eligible counties um, there's 116 across the state the lighter green are our conditionally eligible counties there are 35 and there are only eight counties in the state of georgia that are not eligible to receive any one georgia funds and that's as you can tell in the metro atlanta area um, the deal with the conditionally eligible counties is you're still able to receive the exact same funds that an eligible community is allowed to receive. But in, when you submit your application, you have to have a letter of support from an adjacent eligible community. So if you're down in Lowndes County, you're going to need to pick either Cook or Brooks or Eccles or Lanier County to write you or Berrien to write you a letter of support when you submit your application, because without that letter of support from one of those eligible communities, we're not able to review your application. Um, eligible counties, you can um, receive, you can submit your letters of support from adjacent communities because that allows you to be able to receive the $500,000 cap of funding, uh, traditionally come in at 300,000. And if you get um, letters of support from adjacent communities, you can receive up to $500,000 in equity funding. So just a little bit about that. Any questions about the background of one Georgia, who's eligible, who's not eligible before I move into the programs. All right, hearing none, I'm moving forward. <laughs> um, so here's a list of our grant programs that we run uh, through one Georgia. So we have our equity fund, our edge program, our rural innovation fund, which is very new this year, our broadband grant program and our border region retail program. And I'm going to go through these one by one. So our equity program, it provides financial assistance to eligible applicants in the form of grants for publicly owned infrastructure, or we can provide loans for projects such as building construction and equipment. Funded projects are intended to develop capacity for local economic development and to enhance regional competitiveness. So this fund invests in projects such as water and sewer infrastructure, road, rail and street improvements, and industrial sites, technology and equipment. So when we discuss and think about our equity program, we look at it as our capacity building program. So these are not projects that typically come to us that have a company that's looking to expand or move to Georgia. These are the kind of programs that we're looking for. The applications we're looking for are your planning for future growth. Um, we accept these applications um, online only, and they're um, received on a quarterly basis. You are required to submit an initial project assessment. We refer to that as an IPA. Um, and that is submitted via email. That is not submitted in our eCivis uh, portal. Um, the way you work towards getting your initial project assessment to us is you need to meet with your regional rep prior to submitting that. 
Um, and then your regional rep can sort of steer you in that direction of what you need to do and to make sure that the project that you're bringing to us is actually eligible for our funding. We don't want to waste anybody's time. So your regional rep sometimes has to give you the answer of no, that doesn't fit this program or no, that's not going to work. Um, but we don't want to waste anybody's time, your time or our time in reviewing applications that are not going to be eligible to receive funding or be competitive. Um, but like I said, you submit that initial project assessment, usually within a two week time period, we can turn around a response letter to you. And in that response letter, it will identify different areas of things you need to do in order to make sure your application, your full application is truly complete. Our uh, credit team will review that initial project assessment and give us feedback on that. Make sure that you're a registered authority or that you're a city or county government that's in good standing. Um, and then you will have a time period to then submit your application to us. Uh, the next upcoming deadline for our applications for equity is going to be July 8th. I'm working this week to get that solicitation link uploaded. We have to do a whole new one for FY23. So that should be up by the end of this week. Um, but I think I've only received one initial project assessment that may be looking to, su to submit an application for equity for this next round. Um, but like I said, you can find the links to that on the One Georgia tab underneath dca.ga.gov. Um, so you can provide, you can submit your online application through there. Um, once we receive the applications, it's usually about a three month time frame before you'll hear back from us. So the applications that we receive in July, we will do an internal uh, review of those applications where your regional rep is part of that process. And then we score out the application. So there's a threshold of 325 points that a community must receive in order to be considered um, eligible to receive funding or for us to be able to move that recommendation forward to the board. After we do an internal application uh, review, then it goes to our executive team review where the commissioner and deputy commissioner review those applications. And then we take those as a recommendation to the One Georgia board for them to vote on those. Um, our July uh, application deadline will begin reviewing those July and August. We do site visits for our equity program. So if you submit an application for your equity program, expect an email from either myself or your regional rep to set up a project uh, site visit. And we're really, it's about an hour long. We just kind of go through the application, address any questions we may have, kind of let you give us some feedback on what your community is doing, where you are, any questions you all may have. And then we like to go look at the site of where the proposed project is. Um, and then, so if you submit in July, we will review that July, August. In September, we actually have the board meeting. And then the day of or the day after the board meetings, uh, like I said, they're on a quarterly basis. Then I get in touch with the communities and we begin the really fun process of trying to accept the award and upload award documents and get those returned back to us so that you can start beginning your project. Um, so the cap for one Georgia funding is $500,000 currently for equity. OK, so I'm going to kind of give you all a little this little screenshot right here is some of our equity awards just in 2021. Um, so we awarded seven one Georgia equity awards that created 80 jobs. It benefited 28 communities. The one Georgia investment was a little over $3 million with a total project cost of being about $10,700,000. So what I really want to make a point here on is you see that one Georgia investment is about 30 percent or, or around that you know, 20, 30 percent of the total project cost investment. So what we're really wanting our communities to understand is when you're submitting an equity award for us or an equity project to us, there needs to be some local skin in the game. We understand that, and I'm just going to pick on my home, uh, my hometown of Terrell County where I live. Um, Terrell County probably cannot provide the same amount of skin in the game or you know funds to a project that maybe Darty County could. Um, there, there's just limited funds in a smaller community, so we take that relative on the community that you know is submitting the application, but we do need to see some kind of local investment into the project, whether it's in kind or it's actual dollars that are going into the project. That is something that the board really, um, really scrutinizes when they're looking at these applications. That's something that we present to the board is this is the they're asking for $500,000 for XYZ and they're putting in 
some communities it's a hundred thousand dollars and some it's nine hundred thousand dollars and sometimes it's over a million um like i said it's all relative to the community and the size that you are but um the the board and our staff really wants to see that local skin in the game when you're talking about projects um, i talked a little bit earlier about how things can be a grant or can be a loan i really want to clarify that a grant is something that has public benefit so if we're laying water and sewer lines um, if we're helping to acquire land for an industrial park or we're looking to help you uh, clear and grub some land get get the site ready or make a pad ready site um, those are the type things that can be a grant when you are looking to benefit just one business or you're going to build a, a speculative building because then you're going to turn around and sell it to someone and there's going to be a profit made or any kind of revenue generated from that uh, spec building being sold, that's going to be in the form of a loan. Um, we have done, the past couple of years, we've done two speculative buildings um, and they've turned around. We, we, we did one in Bainbridge several years ago, and that is what drew Taurus Manufacturing to come there. They did not actually locate in that speculative building, but because they had that speculative building, they were able to get Taurus to come give them a look. And then they found another piece of property, but they recently just sold in May that spec building that we helped them build five years ago. And you do have a five year deferment on that. So say, for instance, if you built a spec building in 2022, um, you would have until 2027 to work to get a tenant into that. And if you don't have a tenant by 2027, you know, five years from the project date, then you'll have to start repaying the loan. But if you if you sell the building or you get a, a tenant in there prior to, then the loan starts coming back to us. It's usually a 0% loan for a 20 year period. So it's not like you're, you're just paying it over time in the future. Um, and then, like I said, we have our grant program that works for literally our, our water and sewer, rail spurs, those type projects. Um, so I'm gonna give y'all a couple of examples of some of our success stories that we've had through equity. Um, and this one's down here in Southwest Georgia. Um, so our Red Hills Business Park that's located in Thomasville, Thomas County, it includes 293 acres. This is uh, now a grad ready and shovel ready site with water, sewer, electric, roads and fiber provided by the city of Thomasville. We injected $500,000 of this um, into the park and the total project costs were $17 million. Um, so the park is now owned and operated by the Thomasville Payroll Development Authority. They have four projects that have committed. Uh, several of them just recently broke ground the first part of this year. Um, so some of the projects they have in there are an environmental waste company, an IT company. Um, they have a high-end wood and cabinet specialist company that's coming in there, as well as Ashley Furniture Distribution. So you can just see by them Using a little bit of our money with a lot of their money, they were able to secure a little more than over uh, 200 jobs that's going to come to this Red Hills Business Park. This project began in 2016, and I, this, I was part of the beginning pro part of this project, and it took until 2022 for, or 2021 for projects to truly commit. But if they had not had this available land and all the infrastructure that was necessary for this, it's a beautiful park, um, they wouldn't have been able to land those over 200 jobs in their community. So that's what we're talking about with capacity is they're they're planning for that future growth that they have there. So um, I will move forward to another one that we did. So this is the Piedmont Parkway up in North Georgia. It was the Development Authority of Walton County. Um, they needed help getting in and out of their park. So they had an entrance on the south end of their park. But they have over 2,500 employees that come throughout this park on a weekly basis. Traffic was a nightmare trying to get in and out of this industrial park. So we helped them with a new entrance way into the park to assist with that traffic traffic flow because this park can hold additional employees. So if you're talking about 2,500 already and then you're talking about, you know, they still have an additional 300 acres that's available in this pro in this park, that's additional employees that may land there. So we assisted with a capacity project of this of just helping them with easing traffic flow in and in and out of their existing industrial park. So those are a couple of examples um, that I have like pictures and actual commentary on, but I will sort of highlight a couple other ones that we have done this past year. So I saw that Carl Rowland and I think Karen Singletary was on here from Sylvester Worth County. They have a grad ready site over in Worth County um, right outside of, well, I think it's actually still in the city of Sylvester, so right behind the Walmart there on 82520. Um, 
And they're working to lay water and sewer lines into that park, and we're assisting with that. That is a grad ready site, and um, it's got great frontage right there on the highway. So we're working with them. Uh, it's been an existing project that's been going on ongoing since the, I think it was like 2020, 2021, when we did that project. It was during the midst of COVID um, <laughs> that that project was awarded. Um, a couple of other ones we've done this past year. Um, Harris County, their development authority up there, they had some additional land within their park and everything was ready to go. They just wanted to get a pad ready site. So they needed to clear some trees out, move some rocks, um, and then actually get a site that was ready. The water and sewer lines were across the road. So we're assisting with $500,000 to get that site actually pad ready. And I will tell you, that's one thing that Governor Kemp really focuses on. He wants us to see these grad ready sites that we have in our community, taking that next step to move forward to be a pad ready site, because we're seeing so much um, interest in our economic development uh, prospects across the state that having those actual pad ready sites, if you've got one that is grad ready and pad ready, they're more likely going to be able to locate someone in your area. Uh, we just have so much interest in the state of Georgia right now. So is there any questions about the equity program or any projects that you'd like to kind of throw out there for feedback on before I move on to our next program? And don't forget, y'all can help us into the chat as well. Or you can hold it to the end. That's fine as well. Jen, Jen I have a question. Yeah. Um, one thing you didn't really, you didn't mention was like pre-agreement cost approval. So yeah. when they submit their IPA, can they put it in the IPA or does it need to be separate? Yeah, so they can submit. So what Tanya is discussing is we call it PACA. It, you know, the state, we like to have a million different acronyms just to confuse everybody. So it's a pre-agreement cost approval. Um, and so when you submit your IPA, if you've already um, started thinking about, say, for instance, you submit an, an IPA to us July, but you don't think your project is going to actually have a full application submitted until our next round in October, but you may want to begin a little bit of work between July in October. Now, we're not going to guarantee that you're going to get awarded, but in your IPA, you can request a pre-agreement cost approval date, a PACA date, and in that IPA response letter, we can provide that. And what that says is, say for instance, you submit that IPA in July, you want to start moving some dirt and doing some things September. What we'll say in that response letter to you is that anything, any work that you've done after your IPA date, the receivable, so say we get it on July 10th, any cost that you incur for that project after July 10th and moving forward, if you are awarded a grant, you can include those costs as part of your total project cost um, and be reimbursed for those. I'm glad that you mentioned that, Tanya, because I did need to clarify and make sure everyone is 100% certain that everything that we do is on a reimbursement phase with One Georgia very, very unlikely that we will ever front you the money on something. The only times we've ever done that is where we've worked to uh, locate some mega sites, purchase of mega sites. And then we, the way we handle that is we just wire the funds at the closing of those. And we've only ever done two of those. Uh, one's coming up very soon. So <laughs> um, it's very unlikely that you're going to get any money up front on those. Um, but it, like I said, everything that we're going to do is going to be on a reimbursement phase. But like I said, just because you receive a response letter to your IPA does not necessarily mean that you are going to be awarded funds, um, that your, you know, that your grant application is something that's definitely going to be approved. Um, everything has to go through our review process. So did I answer that pretty good, Tanya? You did. I okay. got you. Very well, very well. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, I'll be like a preacher. I may be putting y'all to sleep. I'm gonna keep on moving on. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about our EDGE program. So our EDGE program is what we refer to as our deal closing fund across the state. Um, and we really work um, and rely on our partners at the Georgia Department of Economic Development for this program. Sharon Alexander Jackson, she is our uh, program manager for our EDGE program. So you can send me emails and ask me questions about it. I'm probably gonna send you sh to Sharon because she's the one who receives the recommendations from the Department of Economic Development and works through that process with our communities on our EDGE program. So what our EDGE funds provide is financial assistance to eligible applicants. Once again, our funds must flow through a um, 
development authority, a city or a county to receive these funds, and they're going to typically benefit just one individual company. Um, in order to receive a recommendation on these funds, Department of Economic Development has criteria that has to be met, but you also have to be just one county in the state of Georgia and you have to be competing with another state. So say for instance, uh, Terrell and Lee counties are two projects uh, sites that are being looked at in Georgia, but they're also looking at Tennessee and South Carolina. Edge funding is not going to come into play until they eliminate either Terrell or Lee County. And there's only one county or one site in the state of Georgia that's competing with another with another state. And then there's also criteria that has to be met, you know, based upon private investment, based upon how many jobs are going to create it. That's going to determine if the state is going to um, offer uh, an incentive letter or discretionary um, award recommendation or or not. So if it's not a if it's not a huge project and it's not a lot of jobs, um, we may try to steer you to a different program within um, within one Georgia. Now the sister program to this, so Metro Atlanta cannot receive these funds as eight counties that were that were gray in the map earlier on. They cannot receive these funds, but you may hear of something very similar. It's called our REBA programs. So our REBA program and our EDGE look very similar. One's just through one Georgia and one is through just DCA. So our REBA funds can go to assist those Atlanta metro areas, but they also can serve the rest of Georgia as well. Um, like I said, these come as a recommendation from Commissioner Pat Wilson at the Department of Economic Development. It's recommended to our commissioner and he signs off on that and then they're presented to the One Georgia Authority Board for approval as well. Sometimes you'll hear about announcements um, and it may be a year before we actually see, receive the application. There has to be an MOU sign between the company and the state. Um, there's a lot of information they have to provide us and then the community goes in. Sharon will send you a link to submit the actual EDGE application and then we'll walk you through that process. Um, once again, all of this is done through our eCivis portal. So the management of the actual EDGE award is done through our eCivis grant portal after the award is made. So I'll kind of give you all a little background of some of the EDGE awards we did in 2021. Um, so we had nine awards that we made. One Georgia invested 5.5 and some change million dollars into uh, the total project cost of over $902 million that were invested or will be invested in the state of Georgia. We were able to create 1,737 jobs or retaining close to 300 jobs across our state. So this is a great investment. Um, if I could invest $5 million and make $902 million, that would be amazing. I think we all could agree on that. So this is a great investment by our One Georgia Authority Board. We receive EDGE funding every year in our state appropriations. Um, along with our equity as a line item for these. Um, so I'll kind of show you all a little rundown of the jobs that were created. I won't try to read these out to y'all, but you can just sort of see all the different counties and, and you know, they're all across the state. Um, so Ron Floyd, Bartow, Macon,ville Dalton, Whitfield, Ron Floyd again, Hart County, Gordon County, and Emanuel County all received um, One Georgia Authority Edge Awards. Um, and this, this is a breakdown of how we like to kind of look at them, whether they're manufacturing facilities, distribution centers. Um, so these are the companies that landed here in Georgia in 2021 that received EDGE funding or they're going to receive it. Most of the time when they receive this EDGE funding, they're using it to buy machinery and equipment for the companies. So that's part of the incentive to bring them to the state of Georgia. So that's just sort of a little rundown of our EDGE funding. Um, and I wanted to talk to you. So any questions about EDGE funding before I kind of move into um, some mega site discussion and our rural innovation. All right, hearing none, I'm going to move on. <laughs> so, I uh, wanted to, so I mentioned to y'all earlier about a mega site that was recently purchased um, back in 2021 over in Bryan County. Um, so, the state of Georgia worked with the Savannah Harbor Interstate 16 Corridor Joint Development Authority to purchase. 2,284 uh, 2, acre economic development site in Bryan County. This was the um, largest purchase in the state history um, for a mega site in Georgia. And we proceeded with uh, helping to assist with the funds for this through our EDGE program. So sometimes we have to get a little bit creative on how to use our state funds, um, but we, will, we were able to help use our and utilize our EDGE funding um, and then some local um, funds into it, as well as some, the Amazon 
Amazon Corporation bought out a pooler site. And so we were able to use those funds to put into the purchase of this Bryan County mega site. And I think it's been about two weeks ago, it was just announced that Hyundai is going to um, locate at this site. And that's going to bring a little more, I think it was, came over was five or 8,000 jobs to the area. It's a lot. And just last week, we had a, our, our Rural Innovation Review Panel committee meeting, and it was discussed about all the different suppliers that Hyundai is going to bring to the area as well that is going to create an additional couple of thousand jobs in this area. So that's created some discussion around workforce. So that's going to be our in housing. Those are going to be some things we're going to have to look at as a, as a regional area um, to be able to support this. But um, so this was one mega site that was recently done. We're working, and I'm not going to mention who the county is or what's going on, but we're working to help close another mega site in Georgia. Hopefully, we'll close early next week on that one. So because we're just finding that these large employers, they're just looking and they need they need big sites. So we're trying to be ready as a state to go in and provide that land and assist our local communities with that to create those jobs. Um, on to Rural Innovation Fund. This is the beast that we have been given over the past year, as I like to say. And so we've got to live with it. Um, so we're, we're learning as we're all going along with this. So back in 2021, during the legislat legislative uh, session, the Rural Innovation Fund was created and given a little more than 30 $39 million into the One Georgia Fund. Um, it was created with a different mindset of equity or edge, which is our traditional uh, funding programs. So in response to the pandemic, the legislature created this rural innovation fund um, in order to provide a little bit more flexibility for one Georgia funding that didn't meet our traditional funding programs, such as equity and edge. So um, this is also on a quarterly basis. It follows our exact same schedule as our equity application phase. So applications are received July, October, January, and April are our deadlines for those. I had to do my math in my head, guys. Um, so we receive applications online. It's the second Friday of each one of those months. You can go on to the east, you can go onto our website, click on the link, and it'll give you the dates, or your regional rep can provide you those as well. Um, so this program is very different in the sense that we do not have a scoring mechanism with it and we don't do a lot of internal review and recommendations on this. This is the way the rules were written on this program and it's sort of a shark tank theory is um, how it was kind of presented by the legislature. So what we do is I basically take the applications and if you've ever gone through and looked at the application, you will see it is a very short application in regards to our traditional applications. So an equity equity application is far more than 100 pages by the time you're done with it, sometimes upwards of two or 300 pages. Rural innovation, I think the longest one I've seen is 15 pages for this. So we don't require as much uh, information with these, but we will come back to you if we have questions once I begin reviewing these. Um, so what I do is I receive the applications, I go through them and make sure that it's an actual eligible applicant and that it's an eligible activity and that you're not breaking any of the state laws. So you're not don't have a direct conflict of interest that you it's not a direct benefit directly to a company. Um, and then I provide like a one page summary to our Rural Innovation Fund review panel and they go through each one of those. Uh, this past round we had nine that we went through and it takes us about an hour. We talk through that. Um, and then they make a recommendation to the full One Georgia Authority Board. So this is not a DCA internal review or scoring process. It's very, very different from anything we've done in the past. But what the, um, the review panel is really looking at when they're looking at rural innovation is they want to see projects that are innovative. We don't want to see a project that qualifies for equity, but because there is no cap in funding for rural innovation, you're coming to us to ask for $800,000 to lay water and sewer lines to your in industrial park. But really, that's an equity project. You just want to ask for more money. Um, they don't want to see something that can be done through edge funding or this just, you know, another program that we've done in the past. Um, I'll give you in a couple of examples of different rural innovation fund awards that um, the review panel has seen as what they refer to as innovative. Um, that's one 
way that the community, I mean, the panel looks at it and they also look at it as, is there an existing company in the state of Georgia that is looking to expand, but we don't have other funding sources that are going to assist them with that? So are they a company that's looking, say for instance, down in Tattnall County, that was one of the awards, the first awards we gave. So a local company was looking to expand um they weren't they were very honest they weren't looking at another state so they didn't qualify for edge um but they needed some help with some brownfield remediation and some site prep work in order to expand at this new uh this new area right beside their existing property so we went in and gave them a little more than five hundred thousand dollars to work for that brownfield remediation to get the, re the land ready and to acquire the land for them to be able to have that expansion um so they're looking for how does it move the needle for existing companies and how can we fit the need for an existing company or is it something very innovative that you're trying to do across the state? Um, if you have a project that you think would be eligible for that, I encourage you to reach out to your regional rep first um, and then they usually will send an email to me and I'll kind of give them some feedback like yeah or no or maybe have them submit an IPA. So we require an IPA process for this as well. Also via email, the link is on our website for that. And then it typically doesn't take me but about a week or so to review those and get an IPA response letter back to you to let you know if it is an eligible acti activity and an eligible applicant. And then you can, we'll tell you if you're able to submit a full application or not for that. Um, we have not been doing pack of letters for this unless they are 100% requested. I've only um, offered that to one community so far since we've began this program, um, and it was because they t they really came in for an equity um, IPA, and after looking at it, we felt like it fit the rural innovation program a little bit better. With it being such a new program, a lot of our communities were a little scared to kind of go after this one um, at first. And like I said, there is no cap of funding that can be requested for this, but um, what we've been seeing is around that 500,000 to a million dollar range is what the board has been kind of approving on that. We did have one that was a little more than $2 million that was awarded back in April. And I'll kind of, um, it was in Camden County and St. Mary's. What they're doing there is they're taking an old blighted airport facility and they are turning it into an industrial park. But although we gave them a little more than $2 million, the community matched it 100%. So where we're putting in a little more than 2.2 million, they're putting in the exact same amount. So that is another thing that the panel looks at is what is a local skin in the game? And also what we do provide as a, a review process to them is what other One Georgia funding have they received for the same project or in the same park in the past? So um, we're not looking, I know many of you have probably heard, you know, through the years, we're not going to go in and help you acquire the land for an industrial park with equity and then five years later help you put water and sewer into the same park because at that point is basically a state owned property, right? Because we've helped you buy the land, we've helped you lay the water and sewer, usually or a one time ask. Um, so we're not looking to marry our rural innovation fund with our edge fund or edge and our equity. If you come to us for one, you're probably going to get one award for that one set project in your community. Um, so you're not going to get a rural innovation fund award and an equity award for the same project. Um, so I want to go over a couple of the Rural Innovation Fund awards that we've done. So as I said, this was just created and passed last year. We passed the rules for this in October. Um, we received our first round of applications first part of December. So we've awarded them in December and we awarded in April. So, so far, we um, this was just the ones we did in 2021. So in a three week period, we received 10 applications. We, we have we awarded three in 2021, 28 communities benefited. We helped to create 58 jobs and retain 10. Um, we did a little more than $3 million in investment, also with a total project cost on this one of a little more than $10 million. So I'll kind of go through and talk to you about the first three that were awarded in 2021. So we awarded one to the Fitzgerald Ben Hill County Development Authority for a cooperative and innovative kitchen, commercial kitchen to be located there. There are four businesses that are looking to, um, to take the next step in creating additional um, lines in their in their company so they're like a pecan company for example and they want to take the value added approach but it's too expensive for them to build their own commercial kitchen and them along with three other companies came into the development authority and they said well the development authority said we'll help you build a commercial kitchen that you all can kind of come in and a co-op deal and the development authority will maintain it and operate it 
Um, and also they're working with their local uh, college and career path, college and career academy pathway students to to assist in this innovative and cooperative kitchen. So that was what that was one of the ones that the committee looked at and said, man, this is really innovative. We're helping four companies that are existing in Georgia take that next step, moving the needle for them. But also this is very innovative. Um, you know, we're we're engaging the local students and as well as the local community and moving that process forward. Another one we did was $750,000 in Miller County to their development authority. So back during the pandemic, um, the rural hospital collaborative was formed and there was a meat processing facility down in Miller County that was providing the protein to rural hospitals, to this rural hospital food collaborative. And MSM Meats was the name of the company. MSM Meats was looking to sell out. And there was a company out of New York that was looking at buying the company. Well, the rural hospital said, we're going to lose our supplier. So they wanted to go in and buy the meat processing facility just to be able to utilize it for their rural hospital food collaborative. So the One Georgia uh, Authority Board approved a $750,000 uh, award to the Miller County Development Authority in order for them to acquire this uh, facility and be able to assist this nonprofit that is helping provide protein to our rural hospitals across the state of Georgia. And then, as I mentioned earlier in Tattnall County, we did a little more than $500,000 for that one for Rotary Corporation. So they make lawnmower blades. And as we all know, during COVID, we all got in our yards a little bit more. The demand for their lawnmower blades skyrocketed. And so they needed to be able to produce more lawnmower blades. But the, the piece of land that was located next to them needed brownfield remediation. So we're assisting um, with a little more than $500,000 in that project to allow that company to expand over in Tattnall County. So I mentioned earlier that we have two other programs that are underneath the One Georgia Authority, but that um, we really haven't done a lot with over the past couple of years. So we had our broadband grant program and we were moving right along and everything was moving with that and then COVID happened. And then the state received a lot of ARPA dollars, um, RDOF dollars were being announced. And so we kind of put the brakes on our broadband grant program. And um, because of the uh, amount of federal dollars that were being influxed into our communities, we said we need to stop and let the federal dollars work their way, and then we'll come in with a state dollars behind it. So we're working right now with the Georgia Technology Authority, uh, GTA, and they're going to be helping us with the actual um, reviewing of the applications and looking at it from the technical piece of it. Um, but we are looking to re to release a NOFA, a notification of funding availability with our broadband grant program coming up very soon. It's going to be very limited in the amount of funds that we have and the communities are going to be able to um, uh, apply for this because we're looking for communities that have not already received RDOF, Reconnect, ARPA dollars for broadband that you already have a broadband partner that you're working with and can and can get a project done within a two year period and there's going to have to be a local match to this. So it's going to be a very small pool of applicants because we're not looking to put state dollars on top of federal dollars. Um, and you've got to really have a plan and in, in in mind and ready to, to act in to to get broadband to our community. So hopefully we'll have that. Um, We'll be able to re release that NOVA coming up very soon. We're waiting on the GTA uh, staff to provide a little more technical assistance on that NOFA and the application before we move forward with that. So as soon as that is announced, I will send it out to our regional reps and they in turn can then send it out to all of you um, on the local level. I mentioned earlier too about our border region retail program. So this was created in legislature uh, a couple years ago, and this actually technically sits underneath our authority no rules have been created around it. We have not moved forward with it because there's no funding attached to this program at this time. It was designed in order to bring large retail um, people like, we'll say, for instance, Bucky's or Bass Pro that are like a, a destination retail um, location. And it would just be for, it says in the state legislature, within 20 miles of the state borders. So it's really limited in the in the areas of the state that this is going to be able to assist, but until there's funds attached with this program, we're not moving forward with it at this point in time. Um, so that's really all I have. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time and I will stop sharing my screen um, and I will be happy to send this uh, presentation out to Natalie and Tanya and they can send it out to all of you who have attended today. 
um, if you'd like to look back at this or if you'd ever like for me to come and speak to your local development authority or anything about potential projects, I'm happy to meet with that as well. I know that Region 10 has been suffering. We've not had anybody in that role since I left in September. Natalie has done a great job of filling in as well as other staff and in that time being, hopefully we'll have somebody announced very soon that'll be filling that role. So um, if not, always feel free to reach out to me. I'm just an email or phone call away. So. Any questions from anybody? I know that was a lot of information in a very quick time period. Um, I, I don't have any I in the chat yet, but um, Jenna, can you talk about, um, you know, some of the questions that we receive, or at least I received for a region um, around one Georgia is um, downtown versus not downtown and some confusion about, you know, um, what areas are most appropriate for that. OK, so um, that is a very common question across the state. Typically, we have not done any downtown projects through One Georgia um, since we've moved over to DCA. I know prior to there have been a couple we've done with some theaters and that sort of thing in the past. Um, but the reason for that is we have other programs that fit that. So we have our downtown development revolving loan fund. There's a new downtown redevelopment grant program. That's a one time thing that's being offered right now. Um, we have our state small business credit initiative. Um, so there's a lot of other programs that we have available through DCA funding. So typically we don't come in and do a lot of downtown projects with our with our focus. We are really looking at that industrial manufacturing piece for equity and that capacity building, getting ready for that future growth, buying the industrial land, getting the spec building built, laying the water and sewer line, expanding a rail spur, or, you know, rail line, that type um, of project or with rural innovation, what the panel, like I said, is really trying to see is that industrial, that manufacturing business, how are we moving the needle for them or what is innovative? Um, we've had several that have submitted as a downtown area, but um, it's just, we have other programs available. Um, to assist with that downtown area. But as always, re it's, I can never just get this across enough. Call your regional reps early. If you have a project and you begin work on it, a lot of the times if you've already begun work, we're out. We can't participate. And so with, any, with a, the majority of DCA funding, so if you've already started work and you're like, oh, well, this might would qualify, more than likely DCA and one of our, any of our funding programs are not gonna be able to come in and assist with that. So calling your regional rep early and getting them all the information that you can get them in terms of job numbers, private and public investment, what is a local community willing to do? They can provide that information to me so that I can give a recommendation back to them um, whether this will qualify or not for one Georgia funding. Does that help Natalie? Yeah, I think that helps um, clarify a lot for people. Um, this is like the quietest group we've ever had. I know. <laughs> um, so if you have a question, make sure you're unmuting yourself. I covered everything, so. Maybe you did, it's the presenter. <laughs> or they're just tired of hearing me talk, one or the other. <laughs> No, it's good stuff. I really appreciate it a lot. Um, so make sure a lot of you, I can't see your faces, so I don't, I can't see you if you're trying to talk and you're muted and I can't tell you that you are muted. So <laughs> I got a chat. It's Monday. People don't want to talk yet. And it definitely is a Monday because I began my Monday with not having computer. So You gave us very good information, Jenna. Very good. Well, thank You're you, Tanya. Thorough, so. <laughs> well, and, and I rely a lot on Tanya and Lynn. They have, they work with the One Georgia program before coming over to the regional side. So I promise you, um, they're really good resources. Uh, and Natalie is great because she really involves me early on in projects so that I can give a good recommendation. So um, I try to be there and try to be very responsive. But as I mentioned at the very beginning, if I'm not available, you can always reach out to Christy Middleton on our team. She is extremely responsive. So that's our goal. I think Natalie has frozen up, Tanya. Oh, OK, <laughs> well, if there's no more questions, um, it's almost been an hour. So thank sure. you. And uh, and I got to figure out how to start recording this. <laughs> I think I can do that for you. Now. OK. Maybe.
Well, let me see where. I got it. Okay, good. Okay. Well,